Good evening. I would like to call to order the November 4th Lake Washington School Board meeting. Please let the record reflect that all board members are present. Um, I will now entertain a motion to approve the November 4th agenda. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director Stewart that we approve the agenda. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. So tonight, our first item on the agenda is our host school presentation. I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Stephen for the introduction. Thank you. I am so excited tonight to um, welcome Mary Wilbur. Mary Wilbur is our project director um, for our Native American um, programming, and she has guests with her, it looks like, tonight. And so we are excited to have Mary come and share with us some of the things um, that we are doing in our district as we serve our students and families. And I know from being at many of our occasions and seeing Mary in, in the work that she's done along with many, many others that we have a really um, great community of people and they enjoy getting together and they have some really great food. And um, it's, a, it's a good sense of community. So welcome, Mary. I'm gonna have you come up to which, are you ready at this podium? Good, welcome, and welcome everybody. <coughs> and does it automate? Okay, thank you. Wyatt has the halt in a east squeet smeeks to kaka. It's good to be here this evening. I'm Mary Wilbur from the Osuyas Indian Band. I'm from the um, Inselchin people. I wanted to share a little bit about what we do uh, for Native education. In fact, there's a lot that we do for Native education. And um, I had to pick and choose what to share tonight because of the time constraints. We wanted to start by showing a video of our ENAP veterans powwow. There is sound and I don't know. Let me see if there's a mute. Let me pause it for a second. Okay. We're having the 11th Annual Veterans Powwow, sponsored by Eastside Native American Education Program. It's a celebration of song and dance with Native American culture, singing and dancing to honor our veterans. For the past 11 years, we've invited veterans from our community to come and join us. Uh, the students make them gifts. Uh, they share their thoughts about the veterans and have thoughts and songs uh, for our veterans because they have provided a way for us to celebrate our way of living. These kind of events like this, when we bring our children, that's where they learn the culture, the, the, the values that drive their life. It's just always been so important to me. It's like a chance for me to really connect with my Native culture. All these like rituals, they're really cool that I enjoy learning about. The program is, um, it's really great. We get to learn more about our culture. We get to um, experience uh, wisdom from our elders and learn the respect for nature. Title VI program is about having a cultural experience. It's about uh, looking at who they are, their identity, and through the program, they're able to explore their languages. They're able to learn about their stories, their traditional ways. To me, it's important to learn about my heritage. I haven't learned a lot about it, so I like to learn about it. And I'm on a journey to actually get my traditional name. My native name is Mame Takake Moo. It's important that they learn about who they are 
Our children are sacred and we have a responsibility as teachers to show them that way. This powwow, the students and the families of Eastside Native American Education Program are hosting all these people. They're hosting the veterans. They've all come at the invitation of these children. And it's a great honor. We teach them that uh, as, as a Native person to respect your visitors is very, very crucial. So we're very proud of them and what they've been able to do working on the committees to plan this event. I'd like to invite Arlene Neskahai to come up to do a land acknowledgement for us this evening. Dr. Staven, Lake Washington School District School Board, thank you for the inv invitation for Eastside Native Education to come and present this evening. ENAP operates as a consortium, so there's three school districts involved, Lake Washington, Bellevue, and North Shore School Districts. Lake Washington School District is the lead LEA um, for the program. Uh, the students that are here tonight, they are all Title VI um, eligible. So there's something called the 506 form that the Department of Education through the Office of Indian Education requires each parent to fill out for their child to be eligible for the Native Ed program in our three school districts. The tribal enrollment can come from either the child the child's parent or the child's grandparent. They have to have the name and address of their tribe. They have to have their enrollment number on um, the 506 form. And we receive approximately $220 per student. We have 270 students that are enrolled with 506 forms. And our three districts um, contribute $65 per student, and that's what we run our program on. ENAP's program goals include cultural enrichment, student advocacy, culturally responsive leadership experiences, culturally responsive mentoring, parent involvement, Indian education, including language and history. So this evening, I've asked a few of my students to come, and we're going to share a few of the activities that we do throughout the school year. We meet on Monday nights at Lake Washington High School in the Commons area, and we can have anywhere from 30 to 200 people attend. And it's a wonderful place to meet, and we're so grateful to Lake Washington School District to provide such a beautiful building 
for us to be part of. And so uh, this evening, I would like to invite uh, my students to come up. The first one will be Anastasia. Ha, maweweka, nani asa hito. Hello to everyone, my name is Hito. Um, my, na uh, my name means male like bird. My English name is Anastasia. I'm in sixth grade. I go to Inglewood Middle School. And I'm going to be talking about the journey and the traditional naming. So uh, to start for the journey, uh, a lot of the kids have been asking also, uh, Miss Mary and Mr. Arley, uh, about getting a traditional name. So they came up with this, uh, this um, well, the journey to, for kids to get a traditional name. So the journey is not an easy thing to go through. It takes time and for to get your traditional name, it takes a, as long as a regular school year, so 10 months. So for the journey, we start off with, um, as you say, a little easy, like baby steps. We start getting to know the elders. We need to talk about why we want a traditional name to know that we will show this as respect, a symbol of respect, because this is not something that isn't just given, it's something that's earned. So we would start going to sweat lodges. Um, for the veterans power, that's where usually when we start our sweat lodges to give prayers and do praise for the elders. And the kids that are in the journey are, are expect to hopefully come early to actually help prepare the sweat. So we use uh, lava rocks and we uh, bless them. We bless the rock people, and we um, also do tobacco as a blessing. And once everything's ready, we will go into the sweat lodge, which is the main one. And we go through other processes of the journey. Most of it is trying to be more involved into our ENAP community. And this, and the whole time that you're in ENAP and when you're on the journey, you're also showing uh, your, the respect that you have and the respect that you would be having for your name that's, well, hopefully to be given. So through this whole process and towards the end of the school year, you will be given a name, but you're also expected to prepare gifts for your elders, since they are the ones that are seeing that you have the respect for this name, and this is a gift for them because they have seen that you are worthy of this name. And through this whole process as well, the elders are kind of I, it watching you pretty much and getting to know you that you be you build beautiful relationships with your elders i've gotten to know miss mary and mr arley very well through the journey and even now i've gotten to know a elder i've become very close to sadly passed away uh for the powwow if you can see over here we even have uh we have steve um vincent stanley he passed away this spring and he was a veteran, so we put him on our sleeve to honor him. And so through this, like I said, you build very good relationships, and they get to, you get to know them. They get to know you to know your, your name. For me, um, since my name means metal like bird, I have been known for uh, singing for um, uh, when we sing our songs. And so that's how I got my name. But uh, when we come here to receive our name, they are still watching you and uh, making sure that, uh, that you are still worthy. And this is a journey that follows you for the rest of your life. And you get to learn so much about yourself through it as well. I have actually become very comfortable with actually sharing my name at school. That I have had um, my friends, they've asked me and they want to get to know more about my uh, native culture. And I just tell them, well, I tell them about my name, but I tell them that you should come here to get to know more. And this is a beautiful experience. I would hopefully get to see uh, the board members here uh, to come as well. It's a beautiful experience. And so this, for the, um, going back to when getting the name, when you prepare the gifts, you are showing that you have the respect and that's the overall thing, having the respect. And so, once you have given the gifts and through the whole process, you get to still meet all with the elders and you're with them through as long as you are for the ENAP program. But even when you aren't, 
you are you know you're being watched over your ancestors as well. So this uh, traditional name is a way for your ancestors and a way for yourself to actually become part with your tribe or just native culture in general. You feel more involved. You feel like I have more of a purpose here, but either way, with or without the name, you have a huge purpose just coming to this, to our meetings and just getting to know your native culture, even if you don't have one, just getting to learn about it and showing the respect that you have for it is a major deal. And so that's why the journey and traditional naming are such a big impact to ENAP as well. So thank you for your time. Hello, um, my name is Bisho Inata. My English name is Andrew Durso. And I just wanted to take a moment to talk about the sweat lodge and what it means to me and like what sweat lodge is. So Anastasia briefly mentioned the sweat lodge and like uh, the, some of the preparation. And that is for sure like a big part of the sweat lodge, but most of the sweat lodge um, when you're actually in the sweat lodge is, I would say, is the most important part. It's when you're actually saying the prayers for the people or the thing that you uh, wish to um, be blessed. And it's a truly an out-of-body experience, to, for their lack thereof, a better word. And I participated in um, a few sweat lodges over the past few years, and every single time I, I don't come out the same. Um, you, there, you do four rounds in Sweat Lodge. Um, each round you pray for a different thing or per pe people or person. And every time it's uh, just super sacred. So this very latest Sweat Lodge, we um, were praying for our veterans and the veterans powwow to go well. And um, we spent um, one round praying for the veterans, one round praying for um, the veterans' families, another round for everyone who had um, helped put together the powwow. And, and we all, we said our prayers, we went around in the circle, and after that we'd sing a song. And that's all good fun in itself, but it won't be the same without the sweat. So you have these magma rocks, and they're very, very hot. So you put these magma rocks in a pit in the middle of the sweat lodge, and one pours water onto the very hot rocks, it creates steam. So this is very hot steam, and it's in the air. And so that makes you warmer. And so when you get warm, you sweat. So um, your body doesn't like being very hot, and so it can become very uncomfortable for you. But the more you say your prayers and the louder you, you sing, you, don't, you aren't bothered by that. You know your purpose and your, why you're in the lodge and I, your purpose of what you're praying for, and they'll open up the door and let out some steam, and you're like, yes, I've done it. I've gotten through one quarter, only three more times to go. And you, you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you sing, and you sing, and you sing, and it's the, cl the closest I've ever felt connected to my culture. And this isn't just something that you like learn to do over one time. It's a process that um, Arlie and Mary have like let me get to learn, and I've not been ever so thankful. Um, Arlie and Mary know so very much about uh, different cultures, having spent time with um, natives from all over like, the country, from um, the east to the west, from Alaska, everywhere. They, they know so much. Like I can talk to Arlie for hours. She has stories to tell. Mary um, knows so much about culture, and it's really cool to be able to have this pool of knowledge and that I have access to it really like means a lot. And I, I don't know if I'd be the same person without all these experiences. Thank you. Haukola Ampui Wichapui Imachiapi. Hello, my name is Veda Madala, and my Native American name means Morning Star Woman. I am going to be talking about the language exploration restoring 
And during the walk the red carpet night, I learned a story about my tribe and I researched some Lakota words, that's my tribe, and I put them into my story. I did this with my sister and it made me feel good about learning about my Lakota side. On the night of the event, I felt really nervous to share about my story, but then I didn't after because I knew that I had everybody supporting me, and that made me feel really good. Everybody who got their names had to do this. It was very important, and it impacted me on my life because it felt like I could trust people with stories about my tribe, and it was awesome. So, yeah, that wasn't very long. Hatso Sapol Teli Hakun. Hello, my name is Zeppelin Andrew. Um, my Native American name is Alboy, and I'm a member of the Kiowa tribe. Um, today I'll be talking about traditional singing and drumming. So when when we go and sit around this big drum during a, either a powwow or just generally singing and drumming, uh, we sing and we pray and we just let out all of our prayers to all of our ancestors, elders and relatives and relations and it just makes me feel really good inside. I know you could hear me without the mic, so it's fine. Oki Nixokoa Nita Niko Wismoiska Nistopa Black V E I'm Scopy Bakani. Hello all my relations. My name is Chickadee Snow. I'm a senior at Inglemore High School. Uh, my native name is Carries the Prayer. I'm from the Blackfeet tribe, the Amskapi Bakani band. Um, and I'm here to talk about our Enet Powwow. If you look up on the top right, that's our logo for this year. We get a new one every year and we're blessed to have an amazing artist, TJ. He's in the crowd. So just little claps. He made that, he created it, and um, it's to honor the missing and murdered indigenous women for this past year. Um, so our ENAP powwow has been going on for 12 years now, I think. Or 13, my bad. It's our 13 years, and every year it's just a big turnout. We have tons of different, I call them family, um, come out onto the stage and we all have a good time. We spend the night together. We get to dance with one another, meet new people, make new connections. Um, for me, I get to learn um, new dance moves. I'm a jingle dress dancer, that's why I'm wearing this. This is my regalia. Uh, I get to go meet new people, other jingle dress dancers like me, and I learn off of them and uh, have them teach me what they know and sometimes I can teach them what I know. Um, what I really like about our powwow is the inclusiveness of you don't have to be Native American to come. It's not secluded, it's not sectioned off, we welcome everyone. And in my language, it's Nixakoa, which means all my relations. Um, I really like the powwow. I was honored to be asked to be the head woman this year, as well as our 10th year a couple years ago. It's a really great experience. It's a lot of responsibility to be the head woman. Um, Andrew was our head man. We did a really good job together, and I think we really did a good night for everyone. Um, some of the things we do is get everyone to come on onto the stage and feel like they can be there and feel like they're welcome and they're appreciated and that what they're offering is enough because anything that you offer is pretty much okay with us. We're just thankful that you could even come. Um, my sister was also the head woman a couple years ago, which is why I wanted to do it. I've been in the program for about 11 years now, so I've kind of grown up with them, and you know, it's like my second family. So, thank you. Ina 
NAP uses the Search Institute's 40 developmental assets to plan our activities and projects and to evaluate the work that we do. I wish I had more time tonight to show the surveys and all of the information that we've gathered over the past uh, 19 years that I've been blessed to be the director of this program. Uh, the external assets are provided by our community. These wonderful people that you see standing out or sitting out here tonight are some of those that help build our children and send them on a good way when they leave our school doors into the world of adulthood. Our, um, our activities are aimed at the development of the internal assets. And as you look up there, you can see all the different ways that we decide as a parent committee and as an elders council to look at their identity, the intergenerational support that goes on, the social competency that Chickadee talked about, the cultural competency that Andrew talked about and Zeppelin talked about, and the positive values that are instilled in our children and the commitment to learning. That's what ENEP's about. So we'd like to finish tonight by having our students sing a song. So I would like to invite them to come up. And we'll go ahead and do that. And you know what? I was told we need to probably stand right in front of us. Yeah, we, we don't have microphones for the entire space. There's a microphone right in the middle there. If you could circle around it, then people on TV can hear you too. And we'd love to share that. like this. I got it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Singer, um, I apologize. Our auditorium is not set up in such a way that there's a microphone if you face east. And your blessing was lovely. If you wouldn't mind coming over to the microphone on that side and repeating it so that people who are watching this on video could hear your blessing, that would be delightful. Yat eshe, the nan do she ke, she ain't not a tatli chi in the she. I come from the Dene people, the Dene nation, and uh, came to this area to complete my co uh, college degree at Willamette University. And I've been in the Northwest pretty since all that time. Being here in the Seattle area and uh, working with the ENAP program. We are in the traditional lands of the Snoqualmie people. And I was taught by my father as a young boy that whenever we travel from place to place, he would always say, this is the land of the Cheyenne, this is the land of the U people. And you know, there'd be a city there, or there'd be farms and everything, but he always would recognize that that, that is their traditional lands. So here, where we live, 
I always enjoy traveling up the river towards the mountains. In I-90, when you go up there, as you begin to ascend, the mountains have always been very sacred to our people. We gather uh, medicines there. We go there to uh, uh, cleanse ourselves and of all the things of the modern world when we're there, we're renewed and uh, we can feel our ancestors too as well. And as we travel up that I-90, we come up to where the glaciers are and the waters come down. And as those waters come down, that river, uh, it's where the Snoqualmie people live. And I uh, just wanted to say tonight, we really thank you, Snoqualmie people, for all that you have done back through time since time immemorial, all that you sacrificed, all that you prayed for, all that you built, all that you dreamed about. And uh, we are here now, and uh, we hope to add to that with our words, with our thoughts, with our songs, and to, uh, we will represent our people as best as we can here in your land. So we thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. It was fabulous to hear your stories. I appreciate hearing the blessing a few times. That was fabulous to hear the story again. So thank you so much for taking the time to share with us this evening. It's an exciting opportunity to hear what's happening with, with the culture. And we want to point out that they have been exciting. And of course, we want to thank you for all the artwork and decoration and the books we have as well that are all around. So when you get a chance, Anybody who comes into this room, take the opportunity to look around and see what we have. It's a great representation of all the different Native American tribes that are served within this program. I think Director Sage has a comment. I just wanted to make sure that I understood correctly. Are your meetings on Monday nights open for us to come and participate or watch? Yes, every Monday night, anyone's welcome to come and, and be part of our program. We meet from about 6 till 8 till 9. <laughs> okay. Depends on <laughs> some of the little ones might go home at like 7.30 or 8 because we have a new little baby in our program. But anyone is uh, welcome to come and learn about our history, learn about our songs, uh, learn about our food. We have uh, food sovereignty that we talk about. We just touched on a few tonight, uh, but we meet every Monday night during the school year. Thank you. And I wanted to make sure that I said we have 89 different federally recognized tribes represented in our program. And so tonight, when you look behind you, you'll see some of the flags of, the fla of our children that are here tonight. They would find their flag up there. Uh, so wanted to share um, the flags of our p many nations. I want to say that uh, of all the programs that I've seen in Lake Washington, first as a, just a parent and then as a school board member, this is one of my favorite programs of all. And Mary, you're my favorite employee. Uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. And so with that, we will continue on with your meeting. You are welcome to stay. We also know you might have school tomorrow or other activities, so you can please feel free to, to go ahead and do homework. So thank you very much for coming. I appreciate all of you coming to take your time. I love the sound of your, out, your jingle dress. That is fabulous. So our next item on the agenda is public comment. At this point, no one has signed up, so we will go ahead and move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the consent agenda. So I will now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Move uh, second. Been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty to approve the consent agenda as presented. Dr. Stavon, will you pull the board? I will. Director Sage. Yes. Director La Liberty. Yes. Director Stewart. Yes. Director, or President Bleasner. Yes. And Director Carlson. Yes. 
And Dr. Savin, could you summarize the donations? Yes, our donations this month are, um, first of all, in the amount of $34,053.24 from PTSA and from private sources in the amount of $2,859.75 for a very uh, grand total of generous giving in the amount of $36,912.99. And as always, we would like to personally thank everyone who chose to support the Lake Washington School District. Without that, we won't be able to provide the opportunities that we have in serving our students, so thank you very much. So the next item on our agenda tonight is a presentation by Horizon Housing Alliance. So Dr. Stavum. Yep, and I'm gonna ask Barbara Posthumus, our Associate Director of Business and Support Service to come and introduce our guest speaker and the reason for his visit tonight. The presentation up first. All right, thank you very much. Um, Horizon Housing Alliance is proposing a multifamily low income apartment uh, for uh, households existing homelessness. And one of the requirements of, in order to receive funding through ARCH uh, for their project is a requirement to present information um, to our school board tonight. So I'm happy to introduce Patrick Tippy. He is here tonight. He's the Director of Housing Development at Horizon Housing Alliance. He brings nine years of experience working in affordable housing, uh, leading the development of more than 500 housing units and 200 shelter beds in nine counties throughout Washington. Um, before working at Horizon, Patrick was a, a housing development manager at CAC Catholic Housing Services, including leading the development team for the women and family shelter, which is currently under construction across the street from uh, Lake Washington High School. So Patrick, welcome. You can just use the arrow Great. to move your presentation. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you members of the school board for allowing me to come and speak in, about the Horizon Housing Development that's proposed at the Together Center. Uh, so I wanted to introduce the, the three development partners for this proposed development. Uh, they are Horizon Housing Alliance, that's my organization. We're a nonprofit housing developer uh, with a focus on providing housing for individuals and families, particularly those uh, in, in extreme poverty and people exiting homelessness. The Inland Group, which is a for-profit development organization and general contractor, but they do a, quite a bit of their work in the affordable housing arena. And the Together Center, a nonprofit organization based here in Redmond, uh, located on 87th across from Bella Bottega uh, Shopping Center. And they are an operator of a human services campus. And um, we are really proposing this redevelopment at invitation from Together Center. The buildings that they uh, operate in were constructed in the 80s and were develop uh, originally developed as a strip mall and they've been operating a human service campus providing office space, affordable office space to so many nonprofits and governmental agencies that meet basic human services and health needs uh, across both Redmond and uh, the, the region. Um, what we're, the redevelopment proposal is approximately 45,000 square feet of commercial space. Uh, that's the space for the nonprofits and governmental entities, and that'll be owned by the Together Center. And then Horizon Housing Alliance will be, is proposing 80 units of apartments affordable to households up to 80% of the area median income, with about 60 of those units set aside for families exiting homelessness. And then Inland's proposing uh, 204 units of affordable housing for uh, the families, in, in individuals and families, up to 60% of the area median income. This is really the workforce housing uh, for the community. Um, so the process that we're going through is we're really in a feasibility phase at this point. We're looking at land feasibility. We're talking to uh, partner organizations that'll be involved uh, and impacted by the redevelopment. That includes the Together Center tenants. Uh, ARCH, which is the funding organization that's comprised of 13 East King County cities, uh, the school district here, and the city of Redmond looking at uh, pre-application and, and the feasibility of the proposed development. We're also going through informal meetings with various constituents and stakeholders in the community that includes 
the King County Department of Community and Human Services, uh, the coordinated entry staff, All Home, which is the regional kind of policy arm of the homelessness system, and, and the faith community, because they're all important constituents in uh, providing affordable housing in our community, uh, supportive services for the residents of the building, and important uh, assets of the community at large, and we wanna make sure that we hear um, input and direction from them to make sure that we have a successful development. As I mentioned, we're in the, the um, feasibility phase. We're looking at securing our financing and, the, and meeting with stakeholders. This will continue through February of 2020. Um, from February through September, we'll be in the transition phase if, if we are moving forward on the proposed schedule, identifying temporary relocation space, uh, because we will need to relocate the 20 organizations that are currently there during the construction of the new, new structures. Um, we're hoping to be uh, relocating those entities uh, beginning in as early as August, but as late as October, uh, into those new spaces. Uh, construction scheduled to be about two years. With the fall of 2022, the time that both the current uh, nonprofit and human service occupants of the building would be moving into the new space, as well as the 280 uh, new households moving into that and phase through a few months to, to make sure that we have an, uh, an orderly uh, move into the new apartment building. Um, I, I talked a little bit about the, the buildings and the family, uh, focus on families, particularly for Horizon Housing. Uh, this chart talks a little bit about our unit sizes that we're looking at. Um, the, the middle column is the workforce housing that will be owned by Inland. Uh, they are gonna have some studio and one bedroom units, uh, but they'll still have quite a, a number of family-sized units. And when, when you hear me say family-sized units, I'm, I'm speaking to two and three bedroom um, units. Uh, the Horizon development will have uh, about 15 one bedroom units with the majority of the units being family sized units. And Horizon really finds that it's critical to include family sized units in our community, uh, looking at households that are uh, under 50% of the area median income in King County. Um, the average family size for, for that AMI in King County is, is about 2.3. Uh, people per household, but when you look at black households and native households, that rises to nearly five uh, people per household. And so really, as we as we look to build family size units, we view that as an inclusion into the community for, for all members, uh, the black community, the native community, immigrants, and refugees. So that's an important thing for, for Horizon to focus on. Um, we're looking at uh, th this development, we're looking at many different referral sources to help with throughput of, of many of the, the resources that are already in the community to help families uh, transition quickly out of homelessness, potentially even divert from actually being without, uh, without a home at all and, and kind of diverting households that might be couch, couch surfing or, or uh, doubled up with families and friends. Um, one of our resources will be the Catholic Community Services through the New Bethlehem program. That's the, the day center that's currently operating at Salt House Church across the street from Lake Washington High School with the permanent shelter and day center to be open by next summer. So that will be one referral source um, and, the, and the partnership they have with the, um, the safe car parking in uh, the Rose Hill neighborhood. Uh, rapid rehousing program, a program funded through the county to help families who, who are experiencing homelessness or are nearly experiencing homelessness divert from needing to go into the shelter program. Uh, next partner would be working with Hopelink um, to have referrals through the, from their shelter and transitional housing programs, both up in Kenmore and Avondale Park, and case management programs that they operate throughout their uh, pr program and service area. Um, and there's also opportunity for many other referral partners because the, the funding sources that, that we're pro pro proposing to use do not require referral from one entity. So we're gonna be able to um, aggregate referrals from many different programs so that way uh, we can make sure all the pr programs are able to focus their resources on families experiencing crisis and as they are starting to stabilize, provide pr permanent housing in the Horizon development. Um, and some of those other resources could be uh, working with Muslim community 
Resource Center, and even potentially the Lake Washington School District with the homeless liaisons of working with staff at the school district so that uh, units could be set aside to be, uh, have families referred to the units from, from school programs. Um, and that would be, we'd, we need to continue collaboration in the, in the months and years to come, but I think it could be a great way to make sure that, that um, students and their families have, have a stable place to call home. Um, talk a little bit about the development itself and the, the oh so critical supportive services to help these families remain successful in retaining their housing and providing stability to the children in those homes. Uh, we currently have MOUs in place for case management with HopeLink to provide a few staff on site. Uh, behavioral health through HealthPoint to provide what HealthPoint kind of uh, talks about as primary care of behavioral health to really, um, well, there's a lot of folks that have a stigma associated with, with meeting with the counselor. So meeting with somebody that's at a, a health clinic like HealthPoint is a good access point into building a relationship and understanding that relationships with counselors can be beneficial for themselves or their children. And another part of the Horizon development that I'm really excited about is the co-location with the Together Center and those tenants and this important synergies that can, uh, that can move forward with the co-location. Because there's so many organizations that provide supportive services that our residents of both the Horizon and inland portions of the buildings can access. Um, including three organizations that will provide behavioral health and chemical dependency services, um, health point, Icron and Sound, uh, Muslim Community Resource Center that provides energy assistance and gas cards and so many other great resources. Kindering that provides uh, parent uh, skills in, in parenting young children and also working with uh, early childhood development uh, centers to help them uh, with, with some of their various licensing challenges or ways to provide education to uh, households with, with varying educational needs. Um, child care resources, the Washington Autism Alliance, and the Alliance for Peaceable Disabilities. So there's so many resources for families um, that can, they can meet both their housing needs and other services for other aspects of their lives that might be leading to their uh, experiencing poverty or, or helping them provide resources for their children to thrive academically. Uh, the last point I want to talk to is just a little bit, since since uh, this is the school board, want to talk a little bit about the proposed redevelopment and the impact uh, to young people, both both potentially adversely during the relocation phase, but also the, the huge upside of creating a new human services campus that has synergies between these different agencies rather than being put into a strip mall that's been put through Swiss cheese and rebuilt in nine different ways over the last 30 years of really being thoughtful of ways for the conference rooms to be set up uh, to provide meeting spaces and trainings for staff to collaborate and have space away from their residents and clients and not have to share lunch with their with their supervisors but be able to meet and interchange ideas with people in other organizations to figure out how they can better serve their clients. Um, so here I listed some of the different organizations that serve young people. Uh, the one that we're most focused on is the Friends of Youth Shelter that currently operates there. We'll need to find a temporary location for that and then uh, we'd be relocating it back in the Together Center with uh, um, hopefully even better capacity to serve those youth well. Uh, the school district operates the Transition Academy in the space so we'll need to make sure that we provide good timing that uh, works well with the school year or whatever direction the, the uh, program director kind of sees for that program. Um, and then we have the four other organizations that provide either direct or indirect services to young people, uh, Kindering, Child Care Resources, the Autism Alliance, and Alliance for People with Disabilities. So at this point, I'd, I'd like to open it up for questions if anyone has any. Um, and I look forward to continued uh, collaboration with the school district because I'm really excited about the opportunities for this development to serve families exiting homelessness and providing some stability for children as they work on their educations. Director Stewart. Uh, thank you very much. This been a project that has been very interesting to me for well, since I first heard about it about a year ago, I guess. Uh, the, uh, the group home, uh, the aspects that you have of multiple apartments, are you looking at any of those units being available for group homes since you have the WAAA there and the uh, 
uh, and the uh, Transition Academy as one of your clients, or not clients, tenants, if you will. Didn't know perhaps that there would be some units for uh, group houses, uh, group housing, if you will, for uh, because they're not going to have an income worth much. Yeah. At this time, we haven't uh, contemplated that as part of our program model. They're designed as individual apartment units for a single household to uh, sign a lease for that. Mm -hmm. uh, be, and that's partially due to the affordable housing finance with tax credits. There's kind of a, a unique definition of what a household is. Uh, and we haven't, potentially, if we were unsuccessful with some of our funding, that might be a way, a route to uh, accommodate uh, other types of housing needs and serve a, a different uh, demographic rather than a, con, um, a household with the standard residential lease of looking at a, um, a mixed tenant group. I, I think uh, Habitat for Humanity has been able to accommodate those folks too at different locations, and it'd be fantastic if you could do so, especially with the, uh, the young men and women downstairs for me. Yeah. So I, I'm sympathetic to, and impressed by the various resources, but I am found myself sitting here. In 12 years, I haven't seen anything like this presentation. And what I don't understand is what we can do for you. Why are you here? And that's not meant to be harsh. It's meant because I really don't understand why you're presenting to us. And if I don't understand that, that's a problem. Yeah, so I, I reached out to the district staff as a requirement through the, uh, the public funders for affordable housing. And I think uh, they use an application called a combined funders form. So ARCH uses it, King County, City of Seattle, many counties and cities throughout the state and the state itself all use the same application form. And uh, in some of my experience working in other communities, um, they've experienced that uh, Government resources fund capital projects that have long-term impacts on the public infrastructure and public resources in an area. And there isn't always great communication between the various silos that do human services, and I'm including education as a human service. Uh, we built a, a development of Othello, Washington with 60 households. With 60 family-sized units put a pretty large strain on uh, the city of Othello and the schools there. And so I think the requirement is meant to be broad, so that way there uh, is uh, ample opportunity to inform and, and share with the school districts about the potential influx of new units and new households. I think it might be less critical for a large district. Yeah, well, and I'm actually not there. It's, it's more, we're, you're presenting to the board. You're not presenting, presenting to the district. They're two different things. Yeah. And we govern through policy. This is very much not a policy presentation. This is something that's about how the district interacts with other things. This is about the administration. And I want to make sure you're in the right audience. Um, the five of us, if we're doing our job correctly, do not take votes on anything relevant to what you presented tonight. We may express interest and support for it, but this is something that's Jane's team's objective. So go ahead. We may have other entities that request this because this is an informational item for the board and the board president and the superintendent can determine if something comes on an agenda. And this is also a public meeting where this information then becomes available to the public. And I think you stated it very well that there may be impacts that we're some, some of those we're aware of and some of we're not. We're simply being good community partners and allowing him to fulfill the requirements of their partnerships. And that allows us to also be well informed and to inform our public. Public. Thank you. That's well. what I need to understand, because there's not a vote that I see downstream of this. Thank you. No, there's, there's no vote attached to it. It's more being aware of what's happening and being able to partner. As we've spoken about housing with our city partners and speaking with them, this somewhat aligns a bit to that piece as well. So it's purely informational from that regard. One second. Let me just see if Director Sage or Director of Liberty have any questions. Okay. I think it's also important important for our staff uh, through uh, just uh, having the presentation and the fact that it'll be online for our staff to know that in the near future, uh, two years, three years, uh, that there's be, going to be housing that'd be available for our paras, our IAs, our uh, support staff, because many of them will qualify, I would believe, for, uh, for your housing. And that to me is very important because I can't imagine someone 
uh, that's making a para or an IA salary uh, having to drive 30, 40 miles just to come to work. But, but they do because they're dedicated. So I, just a quick question. In looking yeah. at the, so we can expect 280 units, these are all family units? M mostly family units, Majority yes. are families. So then we can expect that impact upon our schools in the downtown area. So that will definitely be something to be paying attention to. My understanding is it's permanent. Is there a time limit at all on the housing or it's? It's permanent. It's permanent uh, housing. It start, start with a year lease, and then it's up to the tenants to renew that lease uh, going forward. OK, great. Just checking in on that to make sure. The other piece that I was just interested in, as you look at the temporary relocation and we think about families, the one piece is you have kindering, but I think of child care in general and that piece, and knowing that that's a huge issue for many families, knowing that we have to work with it in the before and after school care and that we have issues there and trying to be able to provide that. Has that been, is that something that can be considered at some point into that location there? Yeah, we're looking at that uh, and, and with Together Center really taking the lead as kind of our tenant on the ground floor and kind of what's their mission as an organization. And, and there's some tenants who have expressed interest in, in providing, either providing childcare on site or inviting another tenant into space there for child care, either fully affordable child care for the residents of the buildings or a, a resource for, for the broader community. That's fabulous. I mean, one thing I think of is our preschool program, and I don't know if that would be something that we could look at as a possibility um, as we look at trying to expand pre-K and be able to do that and serve our needs. That might be an, an area. So, so I do see. So I thank you very much for coming and presenting. Are there any other questions? Um, I think this is a great opportunity for the city of Redmond and the school district. We appreciate the opportunity to be well informed and prepared because I've, if I remember correctly, so it would be great at some point to understand what the impacts are as we go through. I'm sure this will be all part of the projections that, that we do. Um, I know with the housing up in Redmond Ridge, there was a significant number of children um, that registered into our program very quickly. Um, so knowing that is very beneficial. So thank you very much and appreciate that right. coming. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you for your mission. All right, our next is public and community affairs. And so at this time, oh, actually I'm gonna pass it off to you, Dr. Stavum. You're gonna call up the next person. Well, we can both call her up. Um, Barbara's gonna join us again as the board has set their um, 2020 legislative priorities. One of the pieces that you have asked for is we all think about how we influence the upcoming session and the areas that we know we wanna continue to um, advocate for as a school district is also looking at the current um, impact of some things that are currently in place and projected impacts. And so Barbara's gonna provide us with some additional information. And if we don't have all the pieces tonight, um, if there are other things that we want to know, we can certainly continue to provide that as we begin thinking about how we'll um, carry our message to our representatives and our legislators and make a case for, for um, continuing to promote a strong um, educational program from our state. Great. Thank you. So tonight I'm going to um, just review our legislative priorities. Uh, at the October 7th board meeting, uh, the board uh, uh, passed our legislative platform for 2020. Um, and so the, it covered five main areas, our special ed programs, special education programs and services, um, social emotional learning, school construction funding, simple majority for school bonds, and the school employee benefit board. So in all of, and our legislative platform follows, uh, each priority is connected to areas in our strategic plan. So I'll talk about the first area, which is special education program and services, which of course is important to the academic success, success of our students. So this slide um, talks about uh, the request to fully fund special education. Um, each bar chart, uh, there's two years of actual 2017 um, and 18 and 2018-19, and then our current 2019-20 budget is the third chart over, third bar over, and then the rest are projections. And as you can see um, from this slide, um, the state did provide additional revenue um, in 2018-19 uh, 
additional state funding plus increased in safety net award did reduce some of our shortfall, about $10 million worth. The blue part of the bar is what the state funds, uh, the green part is our federal revenue, and the orange part is, um, in a sense, the revenue for shortfall. Um, for the 1920 school year, um, our expen expenditures of uh, special ed students uh, represents over $60 million of the district budget. Um, and again, the state and federal dollars only cover a portion of these costs. Um, the legislature um, did move in the right direction in the 2019-20 biennial budget. They increased uh, what's called the excess cost multiplier. It's a funding form a factor um, in the funding formula that provided um, a slight increase of about a million dollars. They also increased access to safety net funds um, uh, that hopefully we will be able to apply for um, and see this year. So, but as you can see, um, expenditures will continue um, to increase. Uh, there's still a significant gap between state funding and the actual needs of the district and students. Um, and so we wanna make sure fully funding uh, special education uh, continues to be a top priority with our legislators. So the next area is social emotional learning and uh, uh, part of our well-being in our strategic plan, um, and that's important uh, so that students feel safe and have a sense of belonging in our schools. So uh, our legislative platform uh, provi uh, says we want to make sure there's additional funding provided for social-emotional learning. The uh, left uh, table there um, talks about our state prototypical funding formula. So how schools are funded is um, based on our enrollment and then the state has a um, prototypical model where they say based on your enrollment, here's how many counselors we're going to fund, here's how many health and social services, and um, here's how much we're gonna fund for student safety. So um, the state funds about 69 FTE for counselors, and the district um, currently hires 71 FTE. Um, and on the right there are the current ratios of the stu state prototypical model for counselors. Um, and you can see that, um, you know, at the high school level, it's about one to 230, but it, at the middle school level, it's one, one counselor for every 350. 55 students, and then at the elementary, it's one counselor for every 811 students. So um, that's a little bit challenging, those ratios. And um, so the other area that they fund uh, is health and social services, which include nurses, psychologists, um, truancy and mental health specialists. Um, they provide uh, limited uh, FTE, seven, almost eight positions, and our district actually um, provides 36 positions. And then in the student safety area, um, uh, which includes school resource officers, which our district partners with our um, cities and counties to provide those services for us, our campus security monitors, our playground and stu student supervision, and our crossing guards. We actually have, the state funds about six <laughs> positions, and we actually have over 80, almost 90 positions for all of those, those safety-related issues. Um, and so we wanna make sure that the state is working with school districts um, to provide additional programs to promote social-emotional learning to enhance school safety. So this is just another view of that data uh, showing the dollars spent. Uh, so overall, we um, spend a total of about $7.9 million, almost $8 million on counselors. The blue part is what the state funds and the orange part is the shortfall um, or what we're using our local levy dollars out of. Um, the middle part is the health and social services area. Again, those are the nurses, psychologists, mental and behavioral health contracts. Um, and we spend about $3.4 million, of which the state funds uh, almost $800,000. And then in the student safety area, uh, we spend um, $6.5 million, of which the state funds around $400,000 for student safety. 
So the next area is our school construction funding uh, and simple majority for school bonds, and that follows our strategic um, uh, goals of effective use of resources. And uh, so the first part is um, requesting an increase in school construction funding. Our district, as you know, has experienced rapid en enrollment growth, and that growth creates um, significant demand for um, new facilities and updated facilities. And so currently, uh, the uh, school construction funding formula, the state formula artificially caps the cost per square feet and um, the square feet allocation per student. It is woefully inadequate. You can see that uh, the state provides about $238 per square foot to fund a construction project. And the average construction cost right now um, is around $450 to $525 per square foot. Um, the other issue is that none of the new schools in Lake Washington School District actually qualify for a single penny of state funding. Um, we do receive a small amount of uh, state construction assistance for rebuilding our aging schools, but no funding for new schools. And when we do receive funding for rebuilding our aging schools, it covers about um, 6%, 6 to 6 on one of our elementaries, Mead and Kirk, uh, uh, covers about 6% of those costs. And uh, on Juanita High School that we are rebuilding, it, uh, the state construction assistant covered about 10% um, of that uh, project. So the other area in construction is implementing simple majority for school bonds. This is one we've talked a lot about. Um, we need a, a constitutional amendment to allow for simple majority. The chart on the table on the right shows uh, our last five bond elections since 2010 um, and the approval rating of those bond elections. And as you can see, um, one bond election out of those five five was successful, the February 2016 bond passed by 67, 66%, um, and that is allowing us to open, um, to rebuild uh, four, rebuild two elementaries, uh, Juanita High School, um, open three new schools, um, remodel Old Redmond Schoolhouse, and provide some other uh, projects. And so um, without that bond passing, we'd be in a, a very challenging, even more challenging situation for capacity. So, but as you can see, we had many attempts uh, before that bond. And with simple majority, all of those elections would have passed, so. So the last item is um, school employee benefits board. And of course, benefits are an important component of um, compensation for staff. And we want to make sure we are attracting and retaining staff. So um, one of the things the state legislature did uh, uh, two years ago in the legislative session was um, required, created a school employee benefits board uh, with a goal uh, to bring all employees into the state onto one benefit pool um, in order to um, uh, save in, save money and uh, again pool resources to to get better efficiencies, and so one of the challenges with that is and so Seb uh, we call it the short. Uh, terminology we're using is SEB for that, the abbreviation, and that goes into effect January 1, 2020. And one of the challenges uh, with creating this new law is um, they didn't just take our current program and, and mirror it, um, they expanded it uh, without providing additional funding. So um, the new law required covering substitutes that were not previously covered, and nor is the state funding those positions. Um, the new uh, law required the employer share of the premiums be paid at 100% for all eligible employees, regardless of their part-time or full-time status. Um, prior to SEB, um, if you were a part-time employee, you would get prorated benefits. If you were full-time, you would get um, full benefits. And with SEB, if you work a minimum number of hours, it's essentially um, 630 hours a year or three and a half hours a day for 180 days, um, you receive 
receive full um, coverage for benefits. Um, and so, and the premium costs for SEB are significantly higher than districts paid before. Um, and the state did provide some funding increases for um, the positions that the state uh, funds, but as you know, um, districts are responsible for all the costs of locally funded employees. We hire, as the chart uh, showed before, with um, uh, the uh, social-emotional uh, supports. We are funding uh, significantly higher uh, numbers of employees than the state funds, so we're responsible for those costs. Um, the state um, does not adequately cover the differential between the full cost of benefits for part-time staff, and they um, are currently not providing any funding for substitute benefits. And in addition, when you go have a major transition um, statewide, uh, it's 200,000 employees that are moving to this program. In our district, it's about 3,500 employees, and when you're transitioning that many employees to a new benefit program. We're going through open enrollment right now. Our payroll staff is working evenings and weekends and making sure we're having um, uh, many opportunities for our employees to come and learn about the new benefit program to ensure that they um, have a successful experience and are enrolling and making choices for their benefit programs. And that uh, open enrollment period ends in the next two weeks, and uh, we're still working to get every all of our employees uh, signed up. Uh, so uh, bottom line, the estimated local share to implement SEB is about a four to five million dollar cost. Um, about three million of that relates to the part-time to full-time uh, uh, change and uh, and then the rest of that is an estimated cost to, co for, to cover our substitutes. And so one of the things we wanna make sure we're working with our legislature on is um, the concern about the impact to um, adding um, substitutes and just the impact on that. And so, and I think that, so just in summary, um, so our legislative plat platform to summarize, um, fully fund special education, provide additional supports for social emotional learning, increase school construction funding, implement simple majority for school bonds, and fully fund the cost of uh, the school employee benefits board. So any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Actually, Director La Liberty first. So, um, Barbara, thing is that with Seb, if a, an employee declines the benefits, we're still responsible for the premiums. That is that is accurate. So uh, it's in what the state is doing with that is it's really pooling resources at the state level. So, um, so we won't we don't know the how much we're paying that we're not actually, that employees aren't paying funding from right now, but we, that is something we will be tracking this year. Right. And Once open enrollment ends uh, after November 15th, we will know how many um, employees chose to waive um, medical coverage, and, um, and so we'll, okay. we'll be able to get that data. And one of the things I did forget to mention to say is we won't, because, um, SEB begins kind of mid, you know, in January this year. We really won't have um, a sense of how much this costs us until really the end of the next full um, school year. So the end of the 2021 school year will give us a true picture of what the annual costs will be. Okay, thank you. Director Stewart? Could you send me a copy of the, uh, I, because I don't see that number. Uh, the title was Imp Implement Simple Majority for School bon uh, Bonds. It basically outlined uh, the percentages that our folks came in, because sure. I think it's very helpful for our audiences. And as I speak to folks, I want to make sure they understand that. Director Carlson? I, so I only had one question on this, and that was just, in this slide deck will be used in conversations between the administration and, and representatives, I assume, in addition to by us. And it's just slide four you sent me down a rabbit hole where I'm not sure that we want people going down that rabbit hole, where the point is that we want to um, emphasize that we're, out of our local levy dollars, we're spending more on SPED 
than out of the total revenue coming from the state. From the state budget, I think it's about 10% of it is SPED dollars dedicated. And when we're spending almost 29% of our local levy dollars, that's a direct indication that they are underfunding SPED, the real costs of it. That's the point that we want to make. Uh, what, I, what I fear is that just the chart that was shown sent me down a rabbit hole of we're spending $60 million, and, and I, I have, admittedly, I'm a little bit out of date, but our total budget is a very large number. And that's not I, the conversation that we want to have. We really want to be talking about it's the percentage of our local levy versus the percentage of our total revenue that we receive. Um, they're underfunding SPED, and it's causing us to have to spend more of our very precious local dollars on SPED mm -hmm. than is technically necessary if they were fully right. funding SPED. Yeah, and the, the total budget, the total amount that we're spending on special ed is not out of line compared to other districts. Exactly. So and you're I absolutely don't... right. It's, it's the, yeah. the issue is the percentage of, of funds that the state is not funding us. You know, we're, we're required to spend here and... Um, and so if you and... just, just flip back to slide number four, I, I just wanted to show that the, the, the piece of data you actually really yeah. Is that 29%, 16%, 20%, right. 23 That is right. not what comes across in this slide as your first blush reaction to it. So that's, that's all I'm saying. Other than that, thank you very much. Yeah. The, the mission is right. It's just the picture doesn't necessarily hit it yeah. home. And they, as yeah, hard and as it I, could. I did not call so, that out, yeah. and you're correct. Yeah. That's, so those percentages across the top are the percent of levy, yeah. of our total levy that's used to, and to it is fund increasing. the rest of special ed. So anyway, yeah. thank you. Director Sage. Looking back at your construction slides, I'm sorry, I didn't write down which one, you noted that the average cost to mm -hmm. build is 450 to $525 mm -hmm. um, dollars per square foot, mm -hmm. and that the state provides $238 per square foot, but mm -hmm. that there were some types of building that the state does not fund at all. Right. So we do not receive, so the state funds $238 when they provide state construction assistance money. They do not provide state construction assistance money for new school buildings right now. We do not qualify for any state uh, assistance when we're building new school buildings to accommodate our growing enrollment. So we only qualify for that funding uh, for um, when we're rebuilding and enlarging our schools. So Juanita High School qualified, um, Mead and Kirk, and our Lake Washington High School addition. Our addition at Lake Washington High School is also potentially qualifying. We haven't been officially um, notified we are in the process of applying for state construction assistance for Lake Washington High School. So, so that's the challenge for you know school districts that are growing as rapidly as we are. The state is um, providing uh, no support for the growth portion, the new schools. So, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, Director Stewart. I realize that most of this information really is directed at our state and local officials. But I think it's very good information that we need to be able to carry on to the federal uh, representatives and senators. And with w the addition of one slide, uh, since, what is it, 1974, IDEA has been uh, underfunded. In fact, it's been like 30 to 40 percent since 1974. Yeah. And that goes back to my high school years to show my age. But I'm, my point is that yeah, had that money been made available, the state, the local, so forth, would not have felt such amazingly short shrift on special ed. And the, there are so many things we could have done better for our kids, and we can do better for the future of them if we can just knock a few heads in D.C. But if that little piece of IDEA could be tossed in, mm -hmm. I'd be very happy. I would just add one more thing. Um, we talked about the same kind of how the message comes through is when we talk about social emotional learning and those supports, um, there's a couple of those numbers on the slides that look like the state is close to what the need is, but we are still woefully under resourced for what we would want to have in terms of ratios for counselors to students. And so that's why we also put the ratios on there. The other thing that I don't believe was counted in that, and Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong, 
along is the cost of the curriculum that we use, which is our second steps curriculum, which is an additional cost that, that's incurred to provide that instruction in the classroom, the training, and so there's a lot that's represented within social emotional learning. Districts make choices. Um, every district makes choices about how we utilize our funds, and we want the mandates that come to match the funds that districts are given to carry out those mandates, and that's just a central message that we need to carry as we look at all of this important work. Uh, looking at this slide, could you go back to the, the, just the previous slide? Because I had, it, when I, well, that okay, it didn't look right. But the, the next slide over, it, it's, it seemed to, it's the forward one that... Yeah, so you guys... Did I? But what I think he was concerned about was the numbers adding up on the left edge of the slide, and it, it, they do for the next slide. So slide seven on the left, you've got 7.4 plus 0.5. On the next slide, we get 7.4 and 0.5. Oh, where did slide eight I go? Think it's even, I think it's even closer. Oh, I it's, accidentally believe it. I don't know. It, 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 just, it was yeah. confusing to me. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Okay. I, I think it's just a way that it's, it's, it's summed. It's exactly. That's all yeah. it is. Just, but yep. Um, the only other thing to just be aware of, so this was great to be able to give the overview of sort of where we're at. This will help in conversation to go forward with some of these key things. And Eric's going to highlight some of the things from our meeting on the 30th with some other school districts. But prior to that, the other piece to keep in perspective with all of this is there has been the levy cap that has been placed on. So anytime we have local levy dollars that are being required to go to mandates at the state that will limit our capacity to be able to do those initial enhancements that we're looking for. So the five million that's going to SEB right now, that means that's five million we can't spend on a local required thing because the state hasn't funded that. For special education, there's other ramifications because we're under federal law to manage special education. And if we have to go above and beyond, there's some argument that that's basic education education and now you're going outside of it to a levy so there's potential other impacts so that's part of the reason to really start having these conversations very consistently and concisely about the issues that we as a district face so that our legislators also are well equipped and we need to walk in with potential solutions that they can go forward with so with that I'm going to hand it off to Eric yeah so we had a um, on the 30th uh, director Bliesner and uh, dr. Staven and I met with um, representatives from Four, let me make sure I have these right here. Mercer Island was there, North Shore, uh, Bellevue, Issaquah. That's it, and us. That was, and us. Uh, we all met at the Wanick Center. Um, both board members and staff were there. It was, um, it was pretty neat to have everyone come out to talk about how we can work together or share some ideas of whether we want to work together and if so, how we could work together to have a stronger voice um, in Olympia. Um, it was, um, it was actually pretty exciting to see that there was, and we talked about our priorities here tonight, there was a lot of agreement among the other districts about that, those, that we had a lot of shared priorities. Um, so we, we spent some time talking about that. Um, I think SEB is something that everyone is concerned about and how that will work and um, the impact it will have on all of the districts. And uh, there, was, there was interest in... Social emotional learning. Thank you. And in special education funding, uh, everyone is facing a very similar situation. So we talked about uh, what, are some, what are some ideas for some technical fixes that we can bring forward in Olympia in this session, and also what are some more longer term strategies about how we can work together, uh, how we can message effectively. So the, um, the fallout, or the, the fallout, the, the upshot from that meeting is that we're going to continue um, having a discussion, uh, I think we're, we're, we're aiming to meet again before the WASDA statewide meeting that later this month and keep talking about how, how, what are some strategies that we can employ together as a district. I, I, think, I think that about summarizes everything. Uh, Dr. Stavum, Director Blizzard, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think it's just to, to provide collective voice where we have some similar needs and um, just think about strategies that maybe haven't been employed as uh, strategically as possible. And it was Ledgerup's board president, I believe, from most of the districts and superintendents. And, and I think, um, you know, every district has things that are unique to them, but there are some commonalities too. And in order to provide a louder voice, sometimes you just need to have a few more people join together. Yeah. Anything else? 
I, I think that's all. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Director Carlson. While we're on the subject of legislative stuff, I've discovered something that sometimes you don't know about them until they happen. I wanted to say a huge thank you to several of our local legislators who've been meeting with the AP government classes. Um, in our high schools, we have AP government in all of the four comprehensives, and those classes, one of the things that they do is they try to develop a bill to get something in. And I uh, can't say thank you enough to uh, the two I, my son's class was visited by were uh, Roger Goodman and uh, Patty Cooter. I can't say thank you enough for them to come in and treat the kids with respect and honesty about, hey, we're already doing that, or hey, uh, have you thought about, do you know why we don't do that, or why, why it was stopped when we, it, delightful opportunity, but it's also something where, for those of us who are worried about state policies influencing the district, it might be an opportunity to talk to our AP government teachers about the important things to the district, um, maybe to help them push in the same direction. So anyway, thanks. All right, the next item on the agenda is board comments. Director Stewart. I think one of the things that following on both your comments and uh, Eric's, uh, as we go down to visit with legislators, I think it's imperative that we try to find a way to start including students, mm -hmm. Beca not just uh, uh, the, the uh, districts that have student reps on their boards, but students uh, in the, uh, the government classes that you're speaking of, and students in our special ed department, uh, who uh, they were, you know, you, when you put a face on an issue, you change the dynamic. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's no longer just numbers, it's people. And they start to identify, and that makes a difference. I mean, look at uh, how uh, everyone had been discussing in broad, esoteric terms, uh, climate change until the young lady came over from Europe. And I think we have to put a face on uh, these policies. And it's definitely something where we have an opportunity as well. The AP government classes, many of them have field trips down there during the session mm -hmm. to lobby. Bingo, on their proposed bills, but to whatever extent we can just arm them with yep. stuff that's in their own interest, it would be helpful. Excellent to have student voice always brought up again. We've had the discussion and we have the student who helped present to us at the very beginning of the year, and so we still need to have that added back to what our next steps are going forward as a board and be able to do so. Student reps are highly valued in many locations and that voice, so that's a great thing to be thinking of and we'll look to where we can fit that in. Um, so the next thing, any other comments? Nope, all right, so the next thing is our upcoming board meetings. We have it on November 18th. There'll be a 5 p.m. study session, I'm sorry, with a reception for the National Merit Scholars, I'm sorry, the National Merit Semi-Finalists at 6.30. Um, and then we'll have the board meeting beginning at seven. And so at this time, the board will convene into executive session for 15 minutes to consider the selection of a site or the acquisition of real estate by lease or purchase and the minimum price at which real estate will be offered for sale or lease. It was quite a long thing we're convening for. The meeting will reconvene into regular session at 8.46. And no action will be taken following executive session. So thank you.